Okay, so our next repair will be on our tailstock housing here. So what we're going to do, we'll get a bit better light on this so you can see what's happening. So we have this piece of casting which is broken away and there's a, used to be what looks to be a dog point set screw used to go in here to locate the locking shaft for the eccentric for the tailstock clamp. Now we're not going to weld any of this, the reason being is we don't know if we're going to create any hard spots or further cracking or um, create any distortion. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a long end mill and we're going to machine this face back. We'll probably come back six millimeters, quarter of an inch thereabouts, and then we'll machine up a, a free floating spacer ring that'll sit on the shaft that goes through there. So we'll find a way to get it clamped down. So the way I'm going to clamp this down, we're going to pick up off these two threaded holes there, these are 8mm holes and this is a one of the extension fingers off my rotary table I'll just drill two holes in the side same distance as here so therefore this will mount here and then we can just put spaces underneath to pack the tailstock up um, we can't set it on anything underneath because it's um, the casting has a, a little bit of draft in it and I don't want to scratch the paint. As for the other end um, we have this bore here so we'll get a piece of shafting that goes through the bore and we'll set it up on some packers underneath. Uh, that way then we can just indicate off the top here and off this face here that will put us in a good position to be true to the axis of this bore here. Now if you had an angle plate that would be a really good option to use in this scenario here. I have one angle plate over at the new shop and the angle plates I have here um, still waiting to be machined. If you remember some oh, a fair while ago now we did fabricate them up and I'm um, waiting for the bigger machines to be um, all wired up and running in the new shop so we can get those machined. So it was a pretty simple setup this one just a piece of shafting going through the bore for the quill clamp on a couple of V blocks and packers and just a puller crossbar used as a strap clamp and this end here we have our rotary table extension finger drilled out and bolted to the tailstock a couple of strap clamps and our machinist jacks here to raise and lower so we can get the top face level. Now as far as getting getting it leveled, the forward and rear roll, it doesn't matter at all. We don't even have to check it. What we do have to check is our to make sure we are level this way. So I've just indicated in And we're within a thou that way. Uh, the needle's moving up and down a thou all the way along as it's just picking up the scraping uh, marks here. The other direction we do have to indicate is on the key here. So as long as we're clocked up zero on this face and same here. As long as that's within a, a couple of thou that's okay because that's a large distance and on our spacer where it will be running is only across a short distance. So yeah, we've got it level up and down that way. Now we, we have it level in this plane. So 
we are going to be machining perpendicular to our bore. And as we said before, any movement of the casting that way, it doesn't matter, it will not change the outcome. So we'll get a, a long cutter set up now, so we can reach down in and do our spot face. So the original location of the shaft is right there where it's sitting. So if I machine the casting back to the scribe line that I've put in here, that'll give us a flat face on the casting, and then we'll machine up a collar that pushes it's a slip fit over this part here, and then we'll retain that with two, one or two um, grub screws, and that will take care of the issue. The cutter I'm going to be using has a left hand helix on it, so we run the mill the opposite way. The reason I'm using a left hand helix cutter is I want to be able to see what I'm doing. So if I have a standard helix end mill or slot drill, would we'd be starting the cut over there, this side here, and working in this direction. Um, and it's very hard to see what's going on, but with the, the left-hand cutter starting over here, I can see exactly what's happening. Now, if I was to use a right-hand cutter and start from here, I would have to climb mill, and I do not want to do that on this job, as we're only very lightly clamped, and it's a long cutter, and things can turn ugly very quick unless you have a really rigid setup, a good setup when you're climb milling. So hence left hand flute and conventional milling. So we're just going to run this cutter on 500 RPM and see how it goes. And we're just going to take very light cuts till we work our way back to our scribe line. So she started singing a little bit when we were cutting across that larger distance there. So I'll just drop it back to 450 and that's as low as we can go without going into back gear. Okay, there's no point in taking the rest of this back as it's not going to gain anything, all that will will happen as we lose a bit more bearing area underneath, which there's a lot there anyway, but as there's a groove there, it's not going to change anything, so we'll leave it at that, and uh, yeah, off camera I'll just go and rip up a collar, it's just a round, yeah, just a simple round collar, and then uh, we'll bring you back.
Right, so we've made our lock and collar. So the the pull stud type thing goes on the cam here, and I also made an extra little bush in there to stop the whole show going to limit its travel going that way. So. That uh, should solve our problem. So, yeah, it can't, can't go in any further. And of course, our locking collar, we've dimpled into the shaft there, so it'll lock on the shaft in two positions. And that means we don't need to buggerise around with this circlip anymore. Or Jesus rings, as one of my subscribers calls them. And it's in a real prick of a spot, that clip, so. We've um, sorted all that out, so this part of the mission is complete, ready for assembly. So we're going to flip the tailstock over and have a look at a possible um, thing we can do on the other side of it. While I have the tailstock off the machine and disassembled, I want to take the opportunity on this top surface, say back to about here or so, I want to machine it flat, have a machine finish on the flat. That will allow me then to have a, a position then, I can just plonk a dial indicator on it if I need to set something up over here. It will also give me another two points I can access, drill and tap into for later on because the quill on the tailstock, the readings, the graduations on the quill are very hard to read, they're very faint. So that will give me a machine surface to tap into later on to put um, an auxiliary um, slide on to get a uh, better tailstock reading. But, uh, not having a machine tail surface on top of a tailstock I find is uh, something that really bugs me at times and I don't want to be putting an indicator on and off this all the time and bugger up the um, paintwork. Okay, that'll provide a uh, very good flat surface to mount an indicator on, very easy way to do it. Quite often I might have um, tail stop chuck in there with a four jaw chuck on something and it's just an easy place to mount an indicator. He 
machining come out very well considering well there's no bumps with the transition across the cuts. Now this head was trammed in, I, I did it by eye, purely by eye and it took 30 seconds if that. So it has not had an indicator on it from our last job where we had the head tilted over. So there is a very quick way to do it. You don't need any special tools for a bridge port. Um, I'll show you how to do it one day. Now the last thing we have to deal with, if you remember those markings inside the Morse tape bore of the um, tailstock. I don't know if we can pick them up now. You just faintly see there's actually two sets of markings down in there. So a little bit of bearing blue on this Morse taper um, tailstock centre. It's picked up there and there. There's a ring around it. So that was done by just sitting the centre in lightly and just a oh, stuck and just a slight rotation around and so that tells me then that whatever's in there is an actual high spot and not a low spot um, as putting your finger down it was hard to tell it could have been either way so what I'm waiting for now I've ordered a Morse taper reamer a finishing reamer so I'm going to try and just see if we can't massage those high spots or the, the deposits that are in the um, bore the quill out with a finishing reamer. Now as far as drilling our cross holes through for the um, oilers we have to be, well I was actually reminded of this by another YouTube acquaintance that'll be Ken from HMW 1972. He's got a if you haven't seen his channel, pop over and have a look. He does some pretty good stuff there. Plus, he's just recently acquired, well, a while back. He's sorting it out at the moment, a, um, a Wotan horizontal borer. So, you don't really see many Wotan machines around. Um, my dad actually told me he used to operate a big um, Wotan shaper that came out of um, Germany after the war. Anyway, back to our oilers, what Ken uh, reminded me to check was for any interference. So we have our lead screw and feed shaft support here, and of course our carriage here. So ideally we want our intersecting hole in the middle to drop down to our ways. So Close or close to this area as possible. So so that area there appears to be safe. Ideally what I could do is um, drill in from the rear with a long series drill bit. If I've got one suitable I could do that. Same on the opposite side. So We'll put a cup, there's not much going to be in the way on this side, so we'll go for a similar location. So we know we're safe if we put our oilers in. We're on mark, we're not going to interfere with anything else. But as I said, ideally on the rear and drill down with a long series drill bit would be the best situation. So I've got all of the internals um, all cleaned up and inspected. There's a lot of little parts go into this tailstock. So a couple of little repairs to do as well. This is one of the clamping studs, clamping um, bolts, and the thread is bent on the, on the um, shaft, so God knows what happened there. So you can see it there. So we'll straighten that up. This is the locking handle, this goes in there, so it's the quill lock. It should have a knob or a handle on it, it probably used to have a handle on it, but that's long gone, so I'll do something on the end here and we'll put a handle on it. 
the winder handle for the handle there. I'll put, pop that in the lathe, I'll give that a, a good um, polish up. And uh, we have to make some new way wipers and the quill wiper. As the old ones are pretty, pretty sad. So once we've finished our bits of machining on the tailstock parts, we can slip this one back together. So the lighting situation in the shop's improving. I managed to um, pop up four fluoros, four more. And uh, I've got the walls painted at the back there. As before, we only had the two... Um, Oh, two little fluoros, just those two running before. So with the other four, it's greatly helped the situation. So we'll slowly add to those bit by bit. So at least we can see a bit better. Um, these fluoros here, they can be set on 4,000 or 5,000 or 6,500 K. So currently I have them all set on 4,000 to see how they go. It seems to be all right. It, uh, time will tell. And yeah, the haven't forgotten about the boring mill. I just want to get good headways into this lathe. So while I've got a bit of room on the bench over there, we might as well start stripping the compound off. So probably get rid of this tool post first. Alright, we'll go to plan B with this one. Cheetah bar. Why in God's name would... It's not a left hand thread, is it? Surely not. No, it's right hand. Get this um, out of the way. That's got it. God knows why they've done that up so tight. stinks. <laughs> One genuine Swiss mouldy fix tool post. If you had to buy this brand new, being this is a genuine one, as with the holders, would be probably about close to the cost of what I paid for the lathe. <laughs> So I think we'll take the compound holus bolus. Four 
four oilers on the top. That's a good sign. We might get a break from um, having to cut oil grooves. Fingers crossed. We'll change that so they're all the same size nut. Plus we'll machine up, we'll get rid of these cheesy washers, we'll machine up our own proper washers. So this should just come straight up. That's pretty good and now I was expecting a cesspool. We'll plop this over on the bench. This is in good condition in there. I was expecting quite the cesspool. It's what I get every time I take the one off mine, my smaller lathe in the other shop. That's something I'll have to remember too as the bolts only come out when the cross light is off. That's the hole I come up through there. Okay, let's get this stripped down. wiper. At least it's not completely knackered. That's right, we'll make a new one. Let's just um, back this um, gib strip off too. That's interesting, that's something I've never come across before. It appears to have um, two little adjuster things in the end here. Let's have a close up. Yeah, so there's an adjuster of some type. Never seen it before. So I guess all will be revealed once we slip the end off. center pop just next to it here and one on the top if the lathe's done a lot of compound slide work then that will be quite worn one direction so I'd just rather have some orientation going on there um, Rub screw I'm just undoing here should be the locking screw for that nut. It should say yes. Yeah, which way does it come? go and get a drift. Yeah, 
Okay. Looks all right. Still, till we get it all cleaned up, we won't know for sure. Okay, so there's nothing else to come off this part. Oh, that's the, the old cheesy washer out of there. That can go back with its mate. Okay, so this appears to just only require a good cleaner. Now, the other half, which I'll leave that in, there's no point taking that out unless we have to do some work on here. Okay, now. There is oil grooves there, although minimalistic. I'll bring you down, I'll show you something. So they've got those two crosses for oil ways, so with the cross ones, the oil can go the full width, but putting oil grooves in like that in line with the axis, okay, they've I'll get away with it here as far as I understand because it's only a short groove. Um, you don't really want to continue them down this way any further because from here back the compound overhangs the base. But my thoughts would probably go more for something. Um, we cut into the, I'm going to alter this. We'll just do a diagonal like that. That gives it more of a fighting chance. Okay, so that'll be a job for the bridge port. Just a quick note um, on these oil grooves. Um, generally, as far as I understand, what you want to avoid is putting them in long ones parallel with the axis of movement, as it can promote um, strange wear marks on your surfaces. So it's something to try and avoid. I know some manufacturers do do it, but they have their reasons. But general speaking, as far as I understand, is it's something to always try and avoid putting a long groove in parallel with the movement. So that's why we go for the angle and then come back across. Right, so there's machining to be done on this. So these parts are all ready for a, a really good cleanup. So we'll head back over to the cross slide. Um, I, yeah, I forgot to, when I separated these and I unscrewed this, I actually forgot to press record on the camera. Um, this I'll disassemble over on the milling machine at the other shop as I'll have a vise to, I can put some soft jaws in to clamp the screw and then I can tackle um, these nuts that hold it, the assembly together. So. So I'll do the sides next, but you get the idea, we're back in the um, special mix, the brass brush, the acetone, 
and auto trans fluid. The top here has been scraped, it's just like they've done quite a nice job of it. So um, I just went over that with the um, precision ground flat stones. And these are worth their weight in gold doing this sort of work. That's the lived in look. At least it's flat. No birds sticking up, so we'll leave it like that. Looks good. Gives it a bit of character. Well, okay, that's about all we've got time for um, this video. So, next video, we'll be doing um, a bit on the tail stock as we have the quill to take care of. Hopefully, if the parts came in, um, some oil is to fit. A little bit of reassembly on the tail stock. Um, we might get into some machining doing those um, grooves on the compound slide and we might we'll make good progress there and then we'll um, we can pull the uh, cross slide off here in preparation for removing the um, apron carriage. Of course the um, lead, sh lead screw and feed shafts have to come out before that so That'll be the next video. So, anyway, cheers. Thanks for watching. And, uh, well, we'll see you again, hopefully. Or you'll see me. See ya.